So on the mindset thing that I've been really high on, it, hap it works in marketing, it works in sales, and it works in success, like you just mentioned, which is like, you, if you think about generating, cu having customers have success with the product, then you will get the end result. Yes. But a lot of people are focused on the end result, and it actually creates the wrong behavior. It happens a lot in sales, and it happens a lot in marketing. Um, like marketers think that if they get so focused on driving leads, then the leads will close to revenue. But what you're actually focused on is revenue. And if you think about, okay, I need to convince people how to buy the thing, then you get you stop getting focused on leads. You start getting focused on educating people about the things that they need to know that create awareness of what you do, and then they eventually buy the product. You just by changing the way that you focus in your mindset completely changes the way your behavior works. Yeah, and you take that a step further and you actually focus on, let me help my customer solve a problem or deliver a business yeah. outcome. And if that becomes your North Star, you make the right customer-centric decisions and still those revenue results will follow as well. So talk to me about that in, in the, like uh, some real examples in the success category for that. As it relates to that, yeah, I think it's you know being able to go into a customer and say, you know, you're an office manager. You have a million things on your plate. People are complaining to you all day long. You have a million things on your to-do list. You can never get to them. Even if you plan the most amazing event or the best catered lunch, someone is complaining about something um, and you know, you're underappreciated. And so how can I work with you and make your life easier? How can I help you make your employees happier and take work off your plate? How can I make you look good to your boss? And like, let's have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And when you when you actually relate to your customer in a way, and I actually want to help you and make your life easier and make you look good, that's when they'll open up and they'll say like, okay, well, I have this and this and this, and I don't even know where to start. Um, and then that's when you prove that, okay, like what if we did X, Y, and Z and we take care of all of those things? And if we leverage this part of our product, we can actually get real-time employee feedback. Um, and we can actually have insight into that so we can you know, monitor your food orders weekly um, so that you don't even have to think about the fact that we need to swap out an extra veggie side or whatever it is. And so like, that's how you build sticky relationships. That's how you build retention. And it actually is just helping this one individual like do their job better. Um, so I mean, that's an example of like in my, yeah. at my company today, those types of conversations happening all of the time. So now we'll take a step back to like customer success in general. Um, I see you as like a, a very much so a leader in, in building these things out and I, I really like the way that you think about it. So how I feel like it's an underappreciated function mm -hmm. at the moment right now. Um, and want to try and dig a little bit deeper as to the reason why. Like, do you have any thoughts about why people, why companies seem to underinvest? I see a lot of companies underpay for talent in that area. Um, I see a lot of companies um, underappreciate the both the importance and the results generated by that function. Um, why do you think that is? So I think one is it's a very misunderstood function. And most company leaders have not personally experienced it. So I think um, people often think it's easy, like, oh, you're just keeping a customer happy, right? They think selling is the hard part. They think building product is the hard part. Um, and so there's a misconception that the job is, is easy to do and that anybody can do it. Whenever a customer turns, the first thing people will typically ask is like, what did the CSM do wrong? Mm -hmm. They never ask like, oh, where did the product fail? Or yeah. was the customer's expectations, you know, mismatched because of uh, the sales process and the or seller the right over promised fit. and yeah. delivered? Did the company not define their ICP and did we onboard a customer that is, you know, never someone will serve well? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's never where people go first. Mm -hmm. It like it's so easy to blame the CSM, mm -hmm. and I think I, 
I liken the CSM function to like relationships and like a, like a dating analogy. So it's like, you can follow like a set of steps and go onto any dating website and like pretty much get a date, right? Like I can guarantee that if you do these five things and you do it to enough people, <laughs> like you will get a first date. Um, but you go on the first date and like to get a second date, you actually have to be like an interesting person <laughs> that, that that person wants to keep talking to. And like that is what the customer success function is. It's like you know, the seller can get that date, they can get that customer, but now I have to build a relationship with this person over time. And like all the rules go out the window in a long-term relationship. You could do everything right and it could still not work out, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's not black and white. Like you have to really understand your customer. You have to treat each one differently. You can apply best practices and, and standards, um, but you really have to tailor them to your customer if it's gonna be effective. And so it's one of those things where it's not really black and white, like there's no sil silver bullet. Um, it's very complex and I don't think people, if you haven't been in the function, it's easy to hand wave and uh, assume that it's easy. So I think that's the root of it. Um, whenever I've met a leader that has been an account manager or a customer success manager, anyone who's done that job, they get it and they know how hard it is, mm -hmm. which is why I spent my, the first seven years of my career as one. And so like, I know how difficult it is. I know I've personally been in every situation where I've made mistakes, also where I've done everything right and I've still lost the customer. Um, I do think we're beginning to see a shift. I do think companies now like see that it's important they're hiring for it you're seeing chief customer officer like pop up at more companies mm -hmm. but it's just the beginning and there's like a long way to go mm -hmm. what do you what is the how would you describe the value prop of a well-functioning success organization so for instance like i've been at companies where success is not its own separate function. It's, it sits underneath sales or something. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, it doesn't get very much attention. Also, I've seen that the, um, actually, I've seen this in a lot of cases, that the, the people are treated differently relative to the sales organization. The sales organization, when they had, had you know, something, when they blow out quota, they get a $10,000 prize and go to this island and do all this <laughs> stuff. And the success managers, you know, get a couple thousand dollars or whatever, a couple of days off or something different. Um, I've seen that in marketing. I just wonder, like, uh, <laughs> what am I trying to say with this? I think that that practice from a uh, over glorifying the, the sales function is outdated. I really, I really do. Um, and just wanted to uh, throw that out there and see what you thought about it. Yeah, and I think it, it really matters that whoever the CS leader is at a company, that they have a seat at, at the executive table. I think that, number one, not only is the role critical for maintenance and growth of like typically 80 to 85% of the company revenue, like if you look at um, any sort of SaaS company, the bulk of the revenue that they're getting in year is from the current customer base, not net new customers, right? That obviously changes over the course of time, but um, I think that's critical. The other piece is, and the way I've always positioned myself as a leader coming into a company is, I am the internal voice of the customer. Mm -hmm. And so I need to have a seat and a mm -hmm. uh, seat with product. Mm -hmm. And I need to sign off on the product roadmap, just like the CEO, mm -hmm. because I'm coming to the table with that customer perspective or that those customer insights. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that it is, I don't think that a lot of companies create maybe the org design or the explicit recognition of this function, but that if you you know are passionate about it, like I basically am like, I'm not asking for permission to have a seat at the table, mm -hmm. right? Like, I'm just gonna take one yeah. and like build a compelling case about why you should listen to my opinion because it's actually not my opinion, it's our customer's mm -hmm. opinion. I'm just the one saying it, like mm -hmm. I'm just the messenger. Um, I do think that people recognize that they need to talk to customers more and listen to customers more. So if you can be that, you can beat that drum and mm -hmm. bring those insights to the table, it really creates a lot of credibility. Mm -hmm. um, and it is really interesting with uh, the rah-rah sales culture versus sort of success. I think, again, it has to do with the leader 
finding opportunities to recognize the CSM team in a way that that is meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a lot, a lot, a lot more work to do there. Um, and one of the things that I always focus on too is like the sales team and the CSS, CSM team often have a lot of tension and like conflict in organizations. It's very common. Um, so whether that's like the sale sellers bringing in the wrong customers or over promising same with marketing or, and sales because of the divide or whatever. Yeah. And so I think the other thing is you have to invest in like building bridges between those teams. The mm -hmm. reality is we need every function. We need every team. Mm -hmm. Every team is important. Um, and so I think that's something I, I preach a lot about. It's like, actually we're all on the same team. We all work for the yeah. same company. Yeah. Like, let's think about it that way. Um, do you think companies have over, corrected in terms of the fact that they've started to try and jam so many functions under one leader the chief revenue officer that owns marketing sales account management success support maybe like i don't exa i don't i think every company thinks about it differently because yeah. it's a new function um i just i f feel like we're fixing the wrong problem we could be. I think this is an interesting topic because in my personal experience, when I just had one function, and in hindsight, looking back, I like really optimized for that function, but sometimes at the expense of others because I was I had like I had tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. and I was like, I'm gonna make my team the best team. I don't care about your other mm -hmm. teams, right? When I started managing more teams at my last company. I really appreciated the dependency and the interplay between the teams and how much mm -hmm. that mattered and realized like, oh man, like I, I actually, I think I implemented some things on my team that were not good, mm -hmm. <laughs> like that I didn't realize were in direct conflict with something in the sales process or uh, the way marketing was building awareness. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that um, whether it's under one leader or not one leader, there has to be really strong alignment mm -hmm. between those functions. And I'm not really sure what the right answer is. Mm -hmm. I think I don't think there is a right answer. Yeah. And if there is one leader, if, if that's a good leader, mm -hmm. like one of the things I'm most proud of at Q is I actually got all those teams working well together. Finally. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I think that that, if a leader is able to do that, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. If a leader is unable to do that, then it probably becomes a shit show. Um, that said, I think another way to, to do it is, um, like, I don't know how many companies actually fully define their full customer journey for mm -hmm. the whole company. It's not that common, actually. Um, you know, marketing might do an exercise, but not actually Good. share it with the company, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the CSM might have never seen it or the salesperson. And so, what I've been trying to think about a lot is what can we do at the company level, regardless of org design, to create that alignment across teams. And mm -hmm. I think segmentation is important. Identifying your ICP is important. Um, sort of documenting and communicating the customer journey, what is true today, and like the ideal that we're working towards. I think if those three things are done well, theoretically, you should create an environment where those, you know, that alignment exists. Mm -hmm. um, we we're talking about this earlier incentives that obviously comes into play yeah. as well. Um, honestly, the more I get into commission plans, I'm like, get rid of them all. It's an interesting debate. Um, both on, on both sides, actually. So like, yeah. so sh should more functions in the company be compensated like sales or should more functions in the company be compensated should sales be compensated more like other functions in the company i think that's an interesting debate mm -hmm. um if we look at and I, there's a revolving theme around a lot of the things i've been talking about recently which is like there are things that we consider accepted that we do not challenge at all the president's club, the sales commission plan, um, who owns the voice of the customer. Um, they, um, we need SDRs and AEs. That is the way that you build a SaaS company. Mm -hmm. There are tons of different things that just be have that were invented a long time ago that ref that people refuse to challenge the idea of whether they still apply today. Um, 
So I think it's interesting to look at both sides of the coin. Should should marketers and success reps be comped more aligned with sales? Mm -hmm. Or should sales be comped more aligned with the rest of the people? Should product be comped on delivery of stuff? How does that, I mean, what, what do you think? Just because I know it's such an open topic and it kind of yeah. came out of nowhere. Um, but I think it's, as I think about it, I think it's really interesting. Well, I mean, I know personally, I have never let my commission plan or variable comp dictate my behavior. Um, and in personally. fact, personally, yes. in fact, sometimes I've made decisions that are in direct conflict with an incentive plan that I have, but it is the right thing to do. Sure. And it and, feels great, just to, sorry to interject, it feels great when people say um, say something about how you're measured and you can respond confidently and say, it doesn't matter how I measured, I would do. I would behave the same way regardless of the KPI because I know that's the right way to behave. Yes. Right? Um, I think that's, yeah, so sorry, go ahead. No, and in my career, the best account managers or CSMs that I've had on my team have told me, um, I will, like, no matter how you change my comp plan, I will not change what I'm doing day to day. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the big light bulb that I had at, at Q. And actually, right before I left, we were going to just eliminate the comp. I believe that they did that. I'm not sure, actually, mm -hmm. for the CSM side. Um, but I actually think like the best people in the business do what is right. And mm -hmm. they let the chips fall where they may. They'll take their commission check in whatever form that they get it. Mm -hmm. And those are the type of people that I want on my team. So if that's the case, these people are intrinsically motivated, people are actually admitting that they're just going to do what they believe is right, mm -hmm. then what is the point mm -hmm. of having it to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. Just pay them a higher base salary yeah. um, or something like that. I think the, the difficulty is how do you take a team, like I almost wanted to do this here and was like, okay, <laughs> like that's a huge like change a back. for a lot of people. Like yeah. it's too much too fast, right? Mm -hmm. So let's just make a couple of small changes that even if people don't love it at first, they'll understand why mm -hmm. and and ultimately we'll be fine. Um, but, but that becomes the bigger challenge. Like once you make that decision, how do you actually implement a change like that? Mm -hmm. Um, and how do you convince other people that it's the right decision? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't know. I'm a big believer that, um, like I see it all the time, but like it makes people become coin operated, right? It's like, mm -hmm. well, is this going to count towards my goal? And it's like, do I need to give you a dollar if every time I ask you to do something? Yeah, like, yeah. What's happening here? Yeah. <laughs> um, and it like makes me feel really icky when I have those types of encounters with people mm -hmm. because I get it. Like you have a job, like mm -hmm. you're here because you get a paycheck. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope that you're also here because you like believe in what we're doing and yeah. like, want to better yourself, want to work alongside great people. So it's a really tough one. Like mm -hmm. I have a pretty strong opinion of it on it now, but I'm not sure I know how I could navigate a transition like that yeah. in an organization where it already exists. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to build it from the beginning. Yeah. It's been really interesting for me as I start to build this company. We're up to six people now um, because at all the companies I worked for before, I had to play within their rules. They, they had existing infrastructure. They had decided that they need 10 salespeople for every one marketer. They had decided that this much budget goes to marketing relative to this much budget in sales. They decided that this is how they were going to do things. Um, and it's been really interesting to, to always challenge the different things that other people would consider accepted. We don't have an office. Our employees are all over the country. People think that's great. I think it's great. I think all people are more happy that way. They get to spend more time with their family. They actually end up working more because they're not commuting and they have their laptop on and things like that. So like that's that works. Um, they don't waste money commuting. I'm not stuck with just people in one location. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know what 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 will happen as it scales. We'll we'll start to see that as it works. Um, we don't have a sales function. Like, and you don't need one yet. When we, I don't think that we will need one is the really interesting thing. That's awesome. Um, like there are, there are companies that have raised $5 million that have six SDRs, four AEs, and are not growing as fast as we are. And we have zero salespeople who spend $0 on ads and make zero up on calls. And so like I just, 
I've watched those companies that are burning a quarter million dollars a month at a $1 million revenue value trying to grow. And there's so many other broken things in the system. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it's just been, it's been a really interesting learning process to build it from the ground up because you get to do you get to what decide. you, what you get to decide. And I, I empathize because I know that making changes, for instance, changing from a sales led company to a product led company, from a sales led company to a marketing brand led company, it's really difficult. It, mm -hmm. uh, it squarely falls on the CEO to be able to get that done because the CEO actually drives a ton of the beha more behavior than you think. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, let's um, go back to what you said about the chief customer officer. It's popping up a little bit. I see it. Mm -hmm. um, I see. I see a lot of overlap with the chief customer officer of what a CMO should do. Mm. And so if you look at what the um, what if you look at the four, you know, key areas of marketing, it's product place, price, promotion. That's what a marketer should do. In SaaS companies, they do promotion. They actually don't own any of the other three functions. Um, and in order to build a marketing strategy, you actually need all four of those pieces to work together. Yep. Right? So like if you think about um, some companies that are selling cheap at Walmart, like the price and the distribution channel work together. And then how you promote it would work together in a lot of different things like that. In a lot of startup companies, they've decided to distribute the choices of those four buckets to four different people. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you, how do you feel like, so product has been over there. That was when I got into this world and didn't recognize that the specifications of product didn't fall under marketing, I was blown away. Yep. Um, and then I didn't, and then I realized that marketers don't in this world don't even do market research. <laughs> they don't even talk to customers. I was like, yeah. I was blown away. So, um, do you think that distributing another piece of that function to the chief customer officer, like how do you think that plays in an organization, how it feeds into product and then what happens to marketing? Like marketing is really in these companies being boxed in to, I'm going to run these ads and generate these leads. Um, I'm okay with it because it actually, um, it, the people coming up in marketing are actually less skilled, so it actually works in my favor. Um, but what do you like see chief customer officer wise? It's a really interesting question and it's almost like an over segmentation at the executive level, right? Yeah. Of like sort of back to the full cycle AE conversation. Mm -hmm. um, my. I guess my current view of what a chief customer officer owns or should do is um, is being the main customer advocate within the company and what I call voice of the customer, even though you're, you'd probably argue that's like a marketing function. And I'd say that both people need to do it. Yeah. You who, can, I mean, everyone should be doing it. In everyone company. should be doing it, right? And like, I'm a big believer that one of my favorite questions to ask at like an exec team Q&A is, when's the last time you talked to a customer? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and usually it's crickets, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, when they say, oh, I talked to someone last week, like, okay, that, that's someone they're in a non sales situation, in a non sales situation to learn. Yes. That's the kicker because, um, talking a sales rep, talking to a customer, trying to sell them something, you actually don't get any of the value of what voice of the customer is about. Yep. Because you hear objections that aren't real. You are, you're inherently biased based on what you're trying to accomplish. That's not, it's not really voice of the customer work. In my view, voice of the customer work is any answer that you get, first you have to make people feel safe to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. And then any answer that you get, it could be your product sucks, it doesn't do this, this, and this. Like, that's a good thing. Like you can't um, I wouldn't buy this because of this, this, and this reason. Yep. That is good that is good information. Um, I think people see it as I think people get happy ears and try and hear only the things that they want to hear yep. or they frame their questions in order to lead people to the answers that they want to hear. Um, I think it's actually a very challenging um, skill to be able to not ask direct questions, but get to the answers that you need by kind of like, I think it's actually kind of like an art. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think, um, you know, in addition to being the customer advocate, being the voice of a customer, I think a chief customer officer has to have an intentional strategy of what the customer journey is. Um, with an emphasis, I do think on post sale. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that, um, you know, the full customer journey is 
uh, it's marketing, it's sales, it's success, it's support, it's operations, mm-hmm. right? But they need to define what that looks like. And again, like, you know, there's the classic account management playbook of like, you know, check-in, QBR, renewal, da 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 And it's like, nobody wants to meet with any company quarterly. <laughs> yeah. And you should do a business review. Like, you should have one of those meetings. But, like, annually is typically enough. Um, and, and I think a key piece of that is that in the QBR, the company extracts value and delivers nothing important. Like, right. that's why nobody, if you actually delivered valuable information on a quarterly basis, customers would meet with you on a quarterly basis. Yep. And the way, kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, when you like are actually like, okay, office manager, like I am an extension of your team. I'm here to make your life easier um, and to make you look good to your boss. Um, When you design your executive business review, you say, look, I'm putting together um, this great recap of these milestones we've achieved thus far. Um, a, a plan for mm-hmm. what we recommend to do going forward based on what we know about your plans to improve your employee experience and culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have a lot of great uh, direct feedback from your employees to surface um, so that we can make some key decision points. Why mm-hmm. don't you invite you know, your manager and or anyone else that you mm-hmm. think would be interested in hearing these insights um, and also so that we can celebrate like your efforts yeah. and, and the work that you've done. Like that's how you actually get other stakeholders that come to the table. Mm-hmm. Um, they can give you really important feedback in that. And you're actually, like you said, providing value. You're being mm-hmm. a consultant. Like mm-hmm. that's what a good CSM is a consultant. Mm-hmm. I know all of this about, you know, your situation. I have a lot of experience to pull from. I've seen Many other office managers run programs like this at many other companies, and here's what I recommend that you do going forward. And if you use our product, it will make it that much easier, and I'll take care of X, Y, or Z for you. I think, um, I agree, it's adding value. Um, it's propping up your your champion mm-hmm. um, within their company, and especially a role like that that often is underappreciated, sure. and people do not realize how much these these people do to keep the company running. Um, it can be very powerful. Um, and then again, connecting it to, to business outcomes. So it's like, why do we do all of this? Like, why do you cater lunch on Friday? It's like, you want to create a great employee experience, right? You want to have a great culture. Um, you want to attract and retain your talent. You want to motivate people. You want people to want to come to work. Right. And so reminding people like this isn't just about lunch, right? Like all of this is contributing to, this greater sort of business objective that you have Mm -hmm. and you have to connect those dots for people because in the moment their lunch was late or there was a hair in my salad or like all of these things happen um it's like okay like those are problems we will fix them um but like remind them why we're doing this to begin with Mm -hmm. um so yeah how how would you measure the chief customer officer Um, it's a good question. Retention comes to mind, Mm -hmm. um, as like a final outcome, net retention, Mm -hmm. um, of the customer base. Do people measure retention after, and I'm just thinking out loud here because I think it'd be smart, after a certain, uh, time has been, so like you only measure retention on customers that have been with you six months because you have less than a six month churn, it's probably someone else's fault. Do come, when they measure retention, do they do it off something like that? Um, it varies. Typically, you will they will create cohorts and measure based on cohorts. Understood. And so usually I've seen them in six and 12 month cohorts, mm-hmm. like the like the 2019 cohort of customers has X retention rate. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen it quite a bit different, actually. And I think it does depend on the business a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah. Um, but I think I, I do ultimately think like net retention revenue is mm-hmm. really is is really it. Now I do think that um, sort of an, another KPI or metric that I think is tough is like what is the right customer satisfaction metric, right? Mm-hmm. You have NPS, you have CSAT. There's this like customer effort score that's like kind of interesting, which is like mm-hmm. how hard is it? How much effort do they have to put in to like use your product? Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think any of those really tell the whole picture. People love NPS, but um, I don't like... I don't think you get what you want out of it. Yeah. And it's... I, yeah. For a couple of reasons here, I, 
this is this becomes market research and like a lot of different dynamics I feel like I have experience in. Um, the first thing is that you're sending the email from your com- under your company's cover. <laughs> You will immediately buy your results. People will be more open, more open to opening the email and surveying it. If they either, they'll be more open to opening it if they like you. They'll be more opening open to answering it if they're polar. Mm-hmm. Very few people sit in the middle, mm-hmm. and and will take the time to answer that. And so, we started to do something when we when we would do market research. That when we use Qualtrics, we could send it out under their um, their email domain. So it came off. It looked like it was like a third party research survey. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if this is legal or not either. So let's just like keep let's just put that on the record. I did this a while ago. <laughs> I don't know, but I think it's okay. They offer it as a part of their tool, so I assume it's okay. Um, and that's when you start to get the real information. More unbiased. And so we came out and we had like, how do you feel about um, this brand and then the competitor's brand and you start to really st- see and then you had demographic questions at the front and you you start to um, introduce things that would bias the results later slowly over time so it's like demographic and then it's like what are the three leaders in this category so they have there's been no brands mentioned before that so it's complete unaided recall and then you move into like what is your favorite uh, who do you see as the leader unaided and then start to move into then you start to introduce the brand so like this brand X on 0 to 10 so it becomes you get the quote unquote NPS that you're looking for um, and you can ask a demographic question at some point which which product do you use if any so you can do the filtering and then you go through and you also get to understand okay the people that like this brand are happen to be this size mm-hmm. people that like our brand happened to be this size and this job title, and you start to like get more than an NPS score out of it. Mm-hmm. That then becomes really actionable. Um, I did that uh, a couple of times and found some really interesting information relative to what types of people liked our competitors. Yeah, which then allowed us to say maybe we shouldn't go after those people, uh, but it made us look deeper and then figure out okay actually those people fit into this bucket and they can't buy our product for this, this, and this reason, which then starts to really like, if you are if you go into it not looking for your NPS, but you're actually looking for just gen, like really curious information and then you follow the information, you get to really interesting places. It does. And I think, you know, for um, the businesses that I've typically been in where it's a product and there's an online interaction, but then there's a subsequent like real life interaction. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you even parse out what they're rating? Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like, are you rating the experience with the technology? Mm-hmm. Are you rating it with your experience with the company? Are you rating it with the experience that you had with potentially uh, a third party partner mm-hmm. that you experienced something with, you know, lunch mm-hmm. or a doctor's appointment in real life. Mm-hmm. And so that also adds a layer of complexity and that those have, I've always been in those types of businesses. So it's like, what is the score even yeah. rating against? Mm-hmm. Right. And so it, it's, it's complex. I'm more of a fan of more open ended, like just customer surveys where you ask a combination of, you know, some quantitative stuff, but mostly, either open-ended questions and or some like whether it's multiple choice or ranking like you can get creative based Mm -hmm. on what you're looking to find out but I've typically run those types of like quarterly or biannual surveys and Mm -hmm. those are the most interesting I think Mm -hmm. you'll still have your like extremes Mm -hmm. are the only ones that will respond the people that love you and hate you Mm -hmm. Um, and then you should spend time talking to the people that hate you yeah (laughs) to learn more about why yeah um, and thank them for their time. Like they're actually doing, you touched on this earlier, but they're doing you a favor. If they're giving you the exactly. honest truth. Yeah. Even if it's hard to hear. <laughs> you, you read my mind in, so in where I was trying, where I was thinking about going with this, which is that I think there's two components. One is that companies love to try and measure the things that are easy. Yeah. They like the NPS is okay. Once a quarter, just take it to all the people that are tag us customers, pick the job titles, maybe like filter it by usage for people that are using it so we get a better score, and then send it out and then get it back. Like mm-hmm. they, the quickest, easiest thing is what people have been gravitating towards. Um, the second piece that you alluded to 
and it was, I thought it was really smart, is the qualitative information is way more valuable than the quantitative information, in my view. Mm -hmm. um, I think it works, I think it plays in, in specifically in marketing and customer success, maybe not as much in sales, I don't know. Um, I would argue that some of like the call analysis tools are very qualitative in nature actually, um, and give qualitative feedback on how to be a better salesperson, right? Mm -hmm. And everyone's too busy measuring win rate to think about not doing certain things. But from a marketing standpoint, I've found the most, the most valuable things about whether or not your brand is working is actually the qualitative feedback. Yeah. It's like back right. to the dating analogy. It's like, like, how would you rate your marriage of 10 years on a yeah. scale of one to 10? Yes. You're like, well, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And so like, whether it's in the comments in social or like I went to an event in Boston last week and like 40 people came up to me and knew who I was. Like, so I know what I'm doing is working. Mm -hmm. I don't have, I can't tell you with a number how it's working, but I can feel that it's working. I think people have very, with the, um, whether it's pressure or motivation, or I've been call lately calling it propaganda by tech vendors that you should be able to measure everything, mm -hmm. that they've lost sight that one, not everything can, not everything worth, not everything worth measuring can be measured, I guess. Yep. Um, and if this, if I was measuring this, what I was doing, it would have told me to stop doing what I was doing a long time ago because it took time. And so, I don't know, um, I, I feel like that also plays in customer success. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just don't, I don't feel like enough people are implementing it. They look at the lagging metrics um, and get like afraid, oh, our churn rate dropped down two more like percent, let's go and call, let's have our CS people call our customers and make sure everything's okay. Or, you know what I mean? Like very reactive in nature. Yeah. Um, what are some qualitative indicators that success leaders should be looking for outside of surveys? Like things more observational. One of the things that I love the most is um, truly happy customers will proactively reach out and express their appreciation for a company. Um, and when you're managing a team, um, it's uh, how often those things are coming through. So I, I always try to celebrate those. And sometimes they'll find out who like their manager is or their bosses. I've gotten those emails directly from customers like, so-and-so, Emily on your team is amazing. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I would do without her, mm -hmm. right? And so um, often the volume is not massive there, but that's a huge, um, like... That's an 11 on the NPS. Uh, yes. yes, and I think um, whenever that happens, like I always sit down with whomever that CSM is, and I'm like, "Tell me about your experience with this customer. Mm -hmm. What have you been doing?" Um, and every time I sit down with someone, I always learn about something new mm -hmm. that I, you know, hadn't tried before mm -hmm. um, or didn't consider. And so I think, um, like I said, there's sort of no black and white. Like there's so many different tactics and and ways to go about you know building a relationship with someone um, and so I think capitalizing on on things like that mm -hmm. I think the other piece is customers that are like willing and excited to like uh, write a case study be a testimonial come to an event join a mm -hmm. panel like uh, join an advisory board like mm -hmm. Um, when you have customers that really love your brand so much that they're willing to that, or they're like, they're willing to wear a sweatshirt with your company logo on it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, that's how, you know, you've built a beloved brand, but it's one of those things kind of like you were saying, this is what I say. Like, uh, I don't think there's a measurement for product market fit. Like you have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's a scale of zero to one. So you could yeah. be getting close <laughs> to it, but when you have it, you know, it's it. clear. Yeah. <laughs> Your stuff's flying off the shelves, like you're seeing that growth curve that everybody wants. And so I think the tough part is I think people want to feel like they're in control of mm. getting to that place. And I think the reality is, is a lot of it is timing, it's luck, um, uh, 
you know, you really think about like all of the great tech companies out there, or even like like Slack and all of these things, yeah. like um, like how much of this end state was actually intentional. And Slack went through their own like pivots and, and yeah. changes over the course of time. And so I think in people's pursuit to like recreate these great brands and companies out there, they're measuring things that they think will get them there. Mm -hmm. And they're ignoring the obvious mm -hmm. like signals. Um, I do think common sense is like underrated in business. Oh it's like, just do what makes sense and do the right thing. Yes. But, and don't and why? it. <laughs> but, so I, I believe in that the most. Um, why is it, why is it like that? Why is common sense? It's not even that it's underrated, it's underutilized. I think people feel like there are these secrets. Like I have, you know, team members that come to me and it's like, oh, this client is like really upset about this. What should I do? And I'm like, just be honest with them. <laughs> yeah. Tell them what's going on. Recommend a few solutions, like understand from their perspective, like the pros and cons for each mm -hmm. and like move forward. Like... They're mm -hmm. just a person. They'll get it. Like, yeah, they might be a they might mm -hmm. be mad. They might be annoyed. Like, mm -hmm. it is what it is. Um, I think um, I think people overcomplicate things. I people think there's these silver bullets or like, no, we're gonna solve the problem and like never tell the customer we made a mistake. It's like yeah. no, just tell them we made a mistake. Um, like you'll solve the problem better. And if they find out later, they're gonna be like, you'll lose trust. Yes. Like, what's the point? And so I think it's, um, I don't know what it is, but I think, um, yeah. And then I think people think like, oh, well you've had all this experience, so you know what's best. And it's like, I, that's what I did like yeah. 10 years ago. Right. Um, so I think it's like a lack of confidence in like your instincts mm -hmm. and again, just like treating people. So what I always tell my team, it's like, if you were the customer, what would you want to have mm -hmm. happen? It's like, oh, well I'd want them to like level with me and tell me the truth so that we can like, yes, yeah. treat your customer the way you would want to be treated as a customer. I don't know. It's a good question about why. I just, um, <laughs> I've been really trying to figure it out because like if we look on the, on the marketing side, there's a lot of, a lot of motivation to be able to do attribution. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much you know about that, but um, especially as now, like this like, came from Facebook, this came from blah, yeah, this yeah. came from blah, um, and now the next wave is like multi-touch attribution, so we can like see all these different touch points, and then like give this thing five percent of credit and this thing blah 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 percent of credit, um, without recognizing that it only gives credit to the things that can be measured. Yeah. I want, I, I go and tell 10 of my, you know, customers or clients or whatever that I'm working with that are the right fit that they should use you. There's no measurement on that. Yeah. And they're going to give credit to the Google ad. And they do the wrong things. And there's just no common sense about how people actually buy things. Mm -hmm. Even outbound. If you give 100% credit to outbound, there was a, like, Unless you're like brand new on the phone, there was in interactions with the brand that that person had before they entertained the outbound call. Yeah, um, it's a preservation tactic. Even like we were saying, like people might think their jobs on the line. It's like I need to, I need to prove my worth. I mm -hmm. need to show in numbers. I need to rely. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, in the marketing side, I I do I have been getting closer to trying to figure out why. Um, and I do believe that a, a lot of companies measure their marketing team as if they were SDRs, mm -hmm. where every activity, like at, at an activity level, should drive to some amount of meetings, leads, mm -hmm. that, and, and therefore doesn't invest a lot of the things that I care about, which is brand and things that are unmeasurable and very gray. Yeah. They box them into stuff that's black and white, which then on, like they miss out on a majority of the upside of what marketing actually is. Um, I don't know if there's a customer success parallel in that, but that's, um, I, I don't think that it's a, I think a lack of common sense is how it, how it presents, but it's actually driven by a very logical reason. Or, yeah. or logical or illogical, however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the customer success side is interesting because it's like, what if you have a customer that is spending uh, twice as much as they need to on lunch and you're compensated on retaining and growing your revenue? Mm -hmm. If you really cared about uh, 
doing what was best for the customer, you would say, hey, probably like spend half as much yeah. <laughs> and like still get yeah. mostly the same food. Like cool down on the carrots. Do you want to do okay. that? Yeah. yeah. But then if you're comped on that revenue retention, you're not going to actually want to do that. Mm -hmm. But if a vendor came to you and said, hey, like, actually, yeah. <laughs> you can save 50% by doing X, Y, and Z, you would be like, thank you. Yeah. I'm, you've earned my trust. Mm -hmm. I'm going to work with you from here on out because you did something for me mm -hmm. that, you know, objectively wasn't great for your company, mm -hmm. but you'll retain that customer forever mm -hmm. instead of like milking them for extra revenue for a short period of time until they realize like, Yo, I could get this for half as much, and you're yeah. like, yeah, sort of. <laughs> they call that in sports the things that don't show up on the stat sheet. Yeah. Um, like someone makes a really good block that leads to a 90-yard touchdown. Yeah. Where you'll see the touch, you'll see the 90-yard touchdown in the highlight reel. You may not see the block that actually made that occur over there. Um, and everyone's looking for the 90-yard touchdown, but not willing to do the blocking. Yep. Um, anyway, that was kind of got caught that analogy. Okay, um, next one that I definitely wanted to hit is on on events specific to customers. Yes. And so we see big companies blowing out this idea of like a user conference or mm -hmm. spending a ridiculous amount of money on it, and not having. It. I, I'm not sure that that's the model. Um, I have a different kind of like idea of how I'd approach it. But where do you? Like, how should companies try, and if they, if they, let's say they had, they were going to allocate a half million dollars for events for um, specific to customers, right? This is pr like marketing sales, but let's just pretend that success is responsible for this one. Mm -hmm. um, like, what would be a good allocation of that to, to drive, well, I guess it depends on what KPIs you're trying to drive. Um, but let's just pretend that it's customer happiness or success. So what would uh, what would you think about doing with that allocated money? Yeah, and I would say like, I mean, I think Gainsight and their annual Pulse conference is a perfect example of them doing this like huge, massive user conference, but I think they've done it really, really well. Mm -hmm. I've been to Pulse like four times. I've implemented Gainsight. I tell people about Gainsight, mm -hmm. like I'll probably buy it for my current company when we're ready for it. Mm -hmm. So I think that it can be done well, um, but I don't, I think most people don't do that well. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I do think they're a great example and they happen to be like customer success management software. Mm -hmm. Um, but when Makes I, sense they'd be good at it. when I went to my first pulse conference, it was when I had just taken over the, the, the account management team at seamless. And I came back with like a notebook full of things that I then implemented. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was just like clear value to me. And then I'm like, oh, I need a tool. Like, of course I'm going to buy this. And mm -hmm. I did, right? Like it mm -hmm. worked perfectly. Um, and I got a ton out of it and my company at the time got a mm -hmm. ton out of it. Um, that said, I think the in my experience, the best events that I've seen are um, relatively small, so 15 to 25 customers at a time, and educating them on something that matters to them. Mm -hmm. So when I was at my last- Let's talk through the platters example, because I think this is, we'll get to a really interesting place. So let's the whole stage is set mm -hmm. for your company, half a million dollars, you're only in certain markets, the stage has been set, how are you gonna do it? So I think we do local events in every city. We get our, our, you know, we invite all of our customers, I think with the target of having like, again, 15 to 25 customers per event. It's a, uh, it's an event that is um, basically like a workshop format mm -hmm. where there is some type of facilitator or instructor taking everybody through some type of learning or education process, mm -hmm. very connected and related to their job. Mm -hmm. So uh, the bulk of the folks that we work directly with are either like an office manager, a workplace experience coordinator, maybe they're on the people and culture team. And so bringing them in to talk about um, things that they just need to do in their job, right? Mm -hmm. Here's how you put together a, um, you know, office culture budget for a mm -hmm. year. Here's how you uh, plan a holiday party. Here's how you, um, you know, design your pantry and mm -hmm. your snack wall effectively mm -hmm. to maximize employee happiness and minimize cost. Um, like things that they actually need to do. Here's how uh, 
are the 10 most organized office managers we know like organize their day mm -hmm. to like stay on top of things and be effective um those types of events I've had the most engagement with because they're learning something that they care about. You have a really small group of people in there. You're not really selling them anything. Um, no sales intent. It's community. Like they're able to interact organically with mm -hmm. other people in their role, which they never get to do because every office typically just has one office manager. Mm -hmm. Um, and they really appreciate that. Um, you know, and then, uh, it shouldn't be so long, but you know, typically like 90 minute, two hour sort of learning module. Three hours is too long. Yeah. And then making sure that, you know, little food, little drink, like, you know, some of the, some of the extras um, to have them enjoy. I it. think that you could showcase a lot of the things that you actually do for offices at the event. Yeah. Right. In a way like the catering, I don't That's really very know. very organic. Yeah. yeah. So you could like show it off in a way. Um, the other thing that I think people are really missing is the the capturing of the information, which then goes on the internet later, right? So like mm -hmm. the 25 people have an experience there, the 25,000 or how 250,000 office managers around the country that didn't get to be at that specific event can then experience a similar education event afterwards through content amplification, right. which I'm very high on right now, um, because in my view, um, not to not to belittle the event at all or diminish it, the amplification of the event is more important. Or you'll generate more results. From yes, it. and if you yeah. do them in a small scale, you can actually do a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is where whether it's whether it's marketing working on it or marketing and success working in the format we just talked about, do the event. How, how many cities do you have? Uh, how many? It's just, ever growing. Just, es just estimate Almost like 20. ten. Okay, yeah. so twenty cities. Um, so you could do, I don't know, I, I don't know what would be feasible. I'll just throw a number four, 40 events a year like so two, yeah. to a city per year, um, which then gives you 40, 90 minute videos, yep. which is your entire content strategy for the entire year, which is better than 99% of companies content strategies just by doing that one thing. And you could mm -hmm. do almost that entire thing with less than a half million dollars. Close. Yeah. Um, yet people are spending a month building an ebook that no one sees. Yeah, that's very true. So I've been. Uh, I I believe that that whether it's focused on customers or whether it's focused on prospect or whether it's a mix of the two, the execution that I just mentioned I think is the number one move in B two B marketing today. Mm -hmm. No, I mean I think it's a no brainer. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. I think we uh, hold on, hold on. We have we have a good one here. Let's let's flip the script. Did we do this last time? Were you, I wait? Okay. I don't know. What are you about? What are you about to do? Uh, uh, <laughs> where you can ask me a couple questions. Oh sure. This would be fun. Yeah. All right. Um, well, so. You asked me earlier about the chief customer officer and what I believe that they own, and you also made a comment around uh, sort of the CMO role being very different company to company or not having control of those four levers, mm -hmm. those four Ps that you brought up. Um, and I think we've, we've separately had different discussions around like the CRO debate and what they should own. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is the ideal like executive team, org chart, or structure? Like, which executive functions should have C-level roles? Mm -hmm. I really think it's, there's a ton, of, there's really too many factors in play for me to answer that black and white. Um, what I, and I, I, I think it's entirely dependent on the skill sets of those people. And so, if you go to six companies and you, look at the CMO skill sets and the uh, experience and the actual like delivery of results across those six, you're gonna have very different results. Many of those companies, the CMO shouldn't be the CMO. They should have someone above them that, or, or they should report into somebody and they should be a director level employee, but they've become a CMO for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think it's really difficult to, to, to answer that because if you had that 
CMO that should be a director, maybe they should report to the CRO. And maybe that structure would work for that company. Um, if I worked for a company and you told me to report to the CRO, I would tell you to fuck off. <laughs> that's just the way, that's really just the truth um, because I believe that if you have a, uh, a strong, and a lot of companies wouldn't operate the way that I would have them do it. So I, I understand if people disagree, but um, like, if you're going to operate marketing the right way, then marketing is feeding product. And marketing does a lot more than just this sliver of lead gen to drive revenue. And if you report to a CRO, you, marketing is going to get boxed in to the things that drive, to, to drive results um, in the way that the CRO thinks that they drive results, which then moves you out of the gray that I'm talking about, completely eliminates having space to play. And I know that because, because we... I have conversations with CROs that want to do business with us and they get stuck at that point yeah. where it's like, we are going to do these things. I know that they're going to work. We are not going to be able to measure them. I know that they've worked because we measure lagging metrics after a six month period and watch inbound revenue grow. And I've done that enough companies that I know it's going to work. But when you ask me in a month how this is going to work, I'm not going to be able to tell you. Mm -hmm because this is the way that we do things. Um, because in, in the chase of doing what you want, which is in the chase of trying to measure it, we actually create friction for what we actually want to accomplish. Yeah. Um, so in the, in the org design for sales and marketing, I think it has to be CMO and then someone that's leading um, sales. Um, Post-sale, I, I really do think it's dependent on the organization. Yeah. Um, well, and hearing you yeah. talk about your company, you know, if everybody focused on creating a product that people really needed and marketing it effectively, you know, you're basically making the case that you don't need a sales team for your company. I'm not saying that every company is like that, right? Yeah. But like, I, I, to, to clarify, I don't, I, there are very few companies that have what I would consider the right staffing of a sales organization. They are almost every SaaS company is overstaffed right. by a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're in effectiveness in marketing or the fact that they haven't defined well enough their ideal customer profile so sales doesn't know exactly who to sell to and they're not marketing appropriately. And maybe the product doesn't fit with a lot of people that they're selling so they have churn issues. It's all like this big ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, but for whatever reason, people think that if you have a product and you get to a million ARR, that all you need to do is raise $10 million, hire a bunch of people to sell it, and you'll magically have this business not knowing that there are, um, that the way to grow is different than what it was in the Salesforce era, which is what people, the playbook that salespeople run right now is yeah. how, how Salesforce was built. No, it's true. Um, we were, um, we were talking earlier about like variable comp and um, you know how, how do you make a change within an existing org and it's easier if you're building from scratch. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I get most excited about is like change management mm -hmm. is actually like being a change agent and coming in and you know usually over the course of a year or two actually like completely changing how an organization um, you know runs and and does their thing. Um, it's very challenging, mm -hmm. but um, you're a smart guy. What if you were tasked with um, having to like go from uh, comp plans for sort of all sales and success and do a transition to eliminate them? Mm. How, what would be your plan of attack to go about that? You have as much time as you need, right? It's going to be a phased approach. Yeah. But what do you think would be required in that type of a change management process to basically implement that effectively in a way that did not have, you know, disastrous impact on mm -hmm. the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So when I've had to make, when I've had to have big changes made in organizations, I've actually had to do more influencing than actually implementing. So it's a little bit different, but like, so for me, when I was doing, uh, when I was doing marketing and I needed this process change to happen and with the hundreds of inbound that we were driving, are we good on time? Mm -hmm. With the hundred of inbounds that we were driving, the process change in sales, 
the way to do it was either to talk to each sales rep individually or to just go to the VP of sales and let them drive it. And obviously it's just easier as you work down. So this might not be um, super relevant, but some ideas to consider would be first to, um, to understand people's perspective. Yeah. I think that would just be the, the first thing. It's almost like, like imagine that you are building like a new product inside of this area, right? The first step is to do market research, see if you have product market yeah. fit. Talk to your customer. <laughs> see, if you have pro- see if you have product market fit, see if <laughs> what they're using today is good enough or maybe that there's a better way to do it. Understand what the better ways are. Um, and, and then start, I, I call them like, I have a hypothesis. So once I do this, it's almost exactly like market research. So I go and figure out these things. I take them back. I synthesize them. I say, okay, like this is these are the reasons why they like this comp plan. And these are the things that they don't like. This is my hypothesis. Um, I think that if positioned X, Y, and Z this way, that actually moving to a pure base would get you. Would, they would be happier with that outcome. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I would go and pick five people. Ideally, people that are. Diff, some some way different because right you have to celebrate the heter, heterogeneity of these people they're not all the same mm-hmm. and try and go and understand each one of them's perspective one on one the response to the hypothesis and you'll get some information you refine the hypothesis to a point and then um, at some point you get to a place where you think that you have the right answer but and then you need to be able to go and see if that works within the constraints of the organization yeah um, but I think that you start with uh, you start with the customer and eliminate all constraints and understand where you get first and then see if it can fit. Because if you set the constraints up front, it actually changes your exploration phase. Yep. Because you you already know things that aren't possible as opposed to thinking about it wide open. I like that. And I think more and more I feel like employees and customers are like sort of segments that continue to get compared to one another Mm -hmm. and employees are customers of their company if you will so i like that you can apply the the market research customer research framework to some change management (laughs) i am by no means a uh change management expert but that's how i would do it yeah (laughs) for that it's uh yeah it's it's a really interesting um I think when I was at Grubhub, they acquired five other B2B food companies while I was there. And I had to integrate each of those companies Mm. into the wider org to move their customers, move the employees, get rid of their tech. Um, And that was a really interesting process to kind of understand um, all of the ramifications of those types of changes. And like, you know, doing it with the first and second brand, there were, you know, some eggs were broken Uh and you kind of realize how you need to communicate differently, how you need to manage expectations, manage people through the process. Um, so I love change management is just very fascinating to me. It's like communication, psychology, yeah. like empathy, um, all rolled into one. We were talking about this um, at an earlier session, then we'll bring this in and then we'll close out because I want to be respectful mm-hmm. of your time, is that um, I love this analogy. This guy, Tom Goodwin, puts this analogy on the table with companies which is that there's, there's two premises. One premise is, what would your company look like if you built it today? And if you just ask that question, immediately everyone will think it won't, wouldn't look like how it is right now. There wouldn't, it wouldn't always be the same. Um, and then if you look back, the reason that he explains it is if you imagine that the, um, that the building is, a house, is, a, is an office, right? And so, you know, uh, Q is a company they build a 10-story office for themselves. And then as they start to grow, they're like, oh, we're running out of space. Like, we don't, and imagine that there, it's not that easy to move, right? A company to change is not that easy. It's not like, oh, we just to move into a new office. Mm-hmm. And so they start building these, like, additions. Like, there's a trailer in the parking lot, and then there's, like, this new, like, little, like, attachment over here. And as they keep growing, the attachments grow. Um, companies do this yeah Um, and at some point the building is so ugly that you actually just need to knock it over and build a new build and build a new building but companies can't because of all of the existing infrastructure that's created in here 
Um, there's tons of different, he gives a ton of different analogies. One that Heathrow Airport is a horrible airport, um, <laughs> but they, for so many reasons, but they can't build a new one because there's too much traffic and it would be too expensive to be building one over here while still operating the other one. Yeah. Um, and so they just keep running Heathrow Airport. So I think a lot of companies fall into that camp, whether you're an SMB that has 50 employees, you've already built up things mm -hmm. that make it more challenging to do something differently. Yeah. And then as you start to get into like the enterprise level, it's, there's not even a chance. Like um, you're, I consider it being stuck. Like you literally cannot change. So that's kind of like a very depressing way to look at change <laughs> management. Um, I think it's, I feel like there's only a couple people that are capable of driving that amount of change inside of a company. Um, and I've been recognizing more and more, not really through my own experience, but working with leaders at companies, that it starts with the CEO. If the CEO is not in, it's not happening. Because mm -hmm. it, it, the executive leader underneath, it, it, for a big change, often doesn't, isn't able to actually get it done. It's a very weird way of looking at it, yeah. um, and companies inherit a lot of the behavior and mindset from the CEO without even like actually without even trying. Like the culture actually gets created by their their behavior because of the way that they measure things, how they interact, how they talk, what they do. Yeah. Then actually, like the culture is created at a very very high level. Um, often unintentionally or subconsciously. It's even scarier because, you know, we were talking about this at the very beginning of our discussion, like businesses should be constantly evolving and changing. And so like really I think to thrive, you need to be adaptable, mm -hmm. you need to constantly be questioning the way you're doing things and doing things differently, mm -hmm. yet we create companies um, that are pretty inflexible yeah to change and so it's like um and i go back and forth with um you know just like ripping off a band-aid and because I've, I've had that approach before just like make the change and like yeah. there'll be some chaos and some frustration yeah. and then people will move on versus like sort of being more methodical and incremental about change mm -hmm. even though it'll take longer um but i don't know i'm fascinated by this i think i'm uh I fancy myself someone that 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 can and, and does do that, mm -hmm. um, but it's really difficult. It's definitely easier at smaller companies yeah. when there's like less infrastructure. I've always been in startups. I've never gone. I, mean, I left Grubhub when they got too big for me. Yeah, I've always, <laughs> I started with the company that had 10,000 employees at the beginning of my career mm -hmm. and then went to 300 <laughs> and then went to 20. And then started my now own. Now you're six. <laughs> <laughs> I was one for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. This was fun. Yeah, definitely. We did it. We did it. I had to cut it off because this light is burning up in here. <laughs> How were we guys? Can we keep you entertained? Aww.